When thinking about the acquisition of things that can make a party more powerful or durable, the conversation often sways towards weapons, armor, and accessories. But there's a fourth category that can also have a big difference on a party's ability to progress through a game unscathed, and that category is items. Often used in a direct capacity, items can be consumed during or after battles to revitalize injured party members, or they can be used to cure party members of various ailments. But they can also be used to teach party members different skills, and in some games, the collecting of items is part of something much bigger, such as crafting or acting as a necessary step in the acquisition of a weapon of great power. It makes items quite valuable, and today, we're going to be running through some of the hardest items to obtain. As a small caveat though, in case it was not clear, for this video we will not be classifying weapons, armor, or accessories as items, and we will also not be including key items such as the King of Jump Rope, which is of course acquired after jumping the rope 1000 times in Final Fantasy IX. As, well, these key items aren't actually used for anything outside of plot progression or bragging rights. What we're going to kick things off with instead is an item that's necessary for acquiring the most powerful weapons in Final Fantasy XIII, Trapezohedrons. Throughout much of the earlier days of Final Fantasy, the acquisition of ultimate weapons was pretty formulaic. They could either be dropped or found towards the latter part of a game, or a quest would need to be undertaken, an approach that was implemented in a pretty extreme manner in Final Fantasy X. Final Fantasy VIII was the first game that really differed, as the ultimate weapons needed to be crafted from rare items that could be found throughout the world, and that notion was pushed a bit further in Final Fantasy XIII thanks to the introduction of a much more comprehensive weapon upgrade system. This was an interesting system that allowed any of the lesser weapons found through normal progression to be upgraded into an ultimate weapon, provided, of course, that the player had enough organic materials, inorganic materials, money, and the correct catalyst. And in that regard, to create an ultimate weapon, you would always need a specific catalyst called the trapezohedron. The challenge was that even though there are multiple methods of acquisition, trapezohedron were very difficult to obtain if you wanted to equip an ultimate weapon on every single character, as, well, you would need six of them. You can, for example, purchase a trapezohedron from the R&D depot shop for 2 million gil, but money is not that easy to acquire in Final Fantasy XIII, and some of the better farming methods allow you to only obtain 500,000 gil per hour. So that brings us on to the next method of acquisition, drops from Adamantoys, Adamantortoys, or Longui. Each has a 1% chance of dropping a trapezohedron, which is quite low, but as you would likely be farming these monsters for platinum ingots to sell anyway, you might just get lucky. The only other way to get a trapezohedron is to dismantle powerful weapons, but even though you are guaranteed to get the catalyst from this method, it also costs 1.5 million gil to proceed with the dismantling process, so it's not too different from just farming the 2 million gil and hoping you get lucky along the way. Dark Matter has been around since Final Fantasy IV, and in that first appearance, it could only be stolen from the final boss, Zeromus, using Edge's Steel Command. But even as rare as it was, in that particular game it served no real purpose, and there are rumours that the Dark Matter was meant to be used for something else that just didn't make the final cut, hence why it was dummied out of the North American release, as well as Easy Type. For many of its subsequent appearances, Dark Matter has continued to appear as a very rare item, but perhaps one of the most difficult iterations of Dark Matter to obtain was in Final Fantasy X-2, where it was required to create a very powerful item through alchemy. In this particular game, there were only two sources through which Dark Matter could be obtained, and they were both connected to super bosses who could be found within Via Infinito, Paragon, and Tremor. Each of these bosses was particularly difficult, even with the appropriate strategy, but if you were angling for some guaranteed dark matter, then Tremor was the better option, all you had to do was finish the fight, and a piece of dark matter would appear as a drop, with there also being a chance to receive two if you're lucky. The other method of acquisition was a bit more complicated, as although you could gain a single piece as a rare drop after defeating Paragon, the much more efficient method of acquisition was through using the bribe command associated with the Lady Luck dress sphere. 
by bribing Paragon at a cost of 1.25 million gil, instead of obtaining just one or two pieces of dark matter, you could gain 10 or even 20 pieces. After both fights, the dark matter you would have obtained could then be used by an alchemist to mix miracle drinks. And these were amazing, as they could grant the incredibly useful effect of having the entire party become invulnerable. Much like Final Fantasy XIII, Final Fantasy XII also had an incredibly convoluted system based around farming. But instead of being used for upgrading weapons, farmed items needed to be sold within the bazaar at the same time in order to get valuable goods like the famed Tornasol. But for our rare item from this particular game, we're going to steer clear of the bazaar and instead focus on a consumable that had a significant amount of utility, Baltoro Seed. Able to grant the user Protect, Shell, Haste, Bravery, Faith, Vanish, Regen, Float, Bubble, and Libra upon consumption, it's easy to see why Baltoro's Seed were a desirable commodity, but due to how powerful they were, the developers also made them rather difficult to obtain. A few could be acquired from chests as you progressed through the game, and there was a repeatable chest found in the Sirobi Steppe that could contain Baltoro's Seed, but that needed a diamond armlet to be equipped to even have it as a potential reward, and luck also needed to be on your side as upon opening a chest, it was the rare find. That made chest hunting a pretty unreliable source of obtaining Baltoro seed, but the remaining option wasn't much more reliable either, as it involved farming magic pots. These enemies could be found in numerous locations across the subterra, and they could be quite tricky, as shown by one even appearing as stage 91 in trial mode. But if you could comfortably control the fight, Baltoro's seed could be stolen from magic pots. You just needed to be quite lucky, as you'd likely come away with nothing or an elixir, as even with the thief's cuffs equipped, there was only a 6% chance of stealing a Baltoro seed and a 3% chance without. Still, if you could stomach the grind, this consumable would make some of the other tough hardships you were sure to face much, much easier. Due to how expansive Final Fantasy XIV is through its numerous expansions and patches, there have been copious amounts of items introduced throughout the past decade. These items also reside within numerous categories, and perhaps one of the most difficult categories to obtain items from is those associated with fishing. But even within that category, there are so many different fish that are difficult to obtain for numerous reasons, and as Square Enix has often been quite tight-lipped about the actual requirements for how to go about catching certain fish, we decided not to restrict ourselves to one specific fish. Instead, we're going to include fish as a general category of item that are very, very hard to obtain. We will, however, use one fish as an example of the struggle that many people go through as they undertake virtual fishing with a high degree of dedication, and that fish is the Ruby Dragon. Introduced in Stormblood via patch 4.56, the Ruby Dragon, according to the in-game lore, is a legendary King of the Deep that is known to all who have ever come near the Ruby Price. And for those who question, it is indeed a dragon, or at least it quite closely resembles one. It can only be caught by fishing at a specific spot within the Ruby Price, which resides within the Ruby Sea, and it can only be lured by using a high-quality Kua as a mooch, but that in itself makes things complicated, as the Kua, an eel, is also caught in the same location, and although it isn't quite as rare, it is still quite difficult to catch. To make things more complicated, the Ruby Dragon can only be caught during certain times of the day under a specific type of weather, cloudy skies in this case, and there's also a large downtime between potential fishing windows. But on top of that, even if all the conditions are perfect and you have the appropriate skill, there is still only believed to be a 1% chance of the fish actually biting. There are people online who consider themselves fortunate to have caught the Ruby Dragon after only a few months of trying, as there are those who haven't caught it after trying for over a year. And that's just one of an array of fish that feature within the same category of rareness. All I can say is, hats off to you if you're determined to complete your fishing log. Final Fantasy VII has quite a lot of permanently missable elements, ranging from weapons, armor, accessories, and even some summons. So it's no surprise to learn that it also has some consumable items that can also be permanently missed, even if that does seem like a weird concept. 
The Ghost Hand, for example, can only ever be obtained from ghosts in the train graveyard, a location you cannot return to after leaving. If you've leveled up too much, the Vagris Claw also becomes impossible to steal from Basilisk due to how the game's stealing mechanics work. But perhaps the most difficult consumable item to obtain is the Earth Mallet. Much like the Ghost Hand, the Earth Mallet could only be obtained from an enemy that resided in a location that could not be revisited once left. That location was a specific part of the Whirlwind Maze, and the enemy that you needed to fight was the Gigas, which had a pretty low probability of appearing. If encountered, it could drop the Earth Mallet, but it would not do so if the Gigas armlet had been stolen during the fight, and even afterwards the Earth Mallet only had a 14% chance of dropping. Should you wish to farm this particular item, then it would be quite slow due to the low encounter rate, the low drop chance, and there only being one possible formation which saw a single Gigas appear. But if you did manage to claim the Earth Mallet, you would have an item that could be used to cast Quake 3 in battle without consuming any MP. Throughout the franchise, the ribbon has often appeared as a rather useful accessory that, more often than not, makes whoever has it equipped immune to a wide array of nasty status effects. As such, ribbons are often quite difficult to obtain, and that part, at least, remained true for Final Fantasy VIII, but unlike many of the previous appearances within this particular game, it did not appear as an accessory. Ribbon was instead an item, and it was quite useful as it could be used to teach the Guardian Forces the Ribbon ability. When equipped, this ability then allowed characters associated with that Guardian Force to, you guessed it, become immune to what the game calls status abnormalities. The thing is, anyone who played the original PlayStation version of Final Fantasy VIII outside of Japan probably never saw this GF ability, as even though it technically was not exclusive to the Japanese version of the game, the method of acquisition pretty much was. And that's because it could only be acquired by playing Chocobo's World, and to do that, the player would need to have access to a pocket station, the memory card peripheral that was exclusive to Japan unless you were able to import one. As time has passed, Square Enix has chosen to make Chocobo's World more obtainable for international players. For example, it can be played alongside the original PC version of Final Fantasy VIII and the Steam re-release, and for the Final Fantasy VIII Remaster, which released in 2020, it was decided to just make the Chocobo's World items accessible through Angelo's Search instead. But even still, there are reports that via Angelo's Search, ribbons are still very rare, and even if you're using the 3x speed modifier, it can still take hours upon hours to acquire enough ribbons to keep important members of your party safe from those nasty status effects. And that brings us on to the final item on our list, the Pink Tail. Final Fantasy IV is notorious for having some of the harshest drop rates in the entire franchise, but if there's one item that has made many hopeful adventurers quit in their quest to obtain the best gear, it's the Pink Tail. To truly appreciate the angst and ire the acquisition of the Pink Tail generates, first we need to picture the prize, the Adamant Armor. Appearing as the ultimate armor in Final Fantasy IV, the Adamant armor grants 100 defense, which is 285% more than the next best armor, the Maximilian. It also has almost double the magic defense of the Maximilian, and the highest magic evasion out of any armor. Not only that, but it also boosts every stat by 15, gives resistance to 3 elements, and gives resistance to a whole host of different status effects. In short, it makes the wearer pretty much invincible, but to acquire the Adamant Armor, you need a pink tail that can then be traded in the Adamant Isle Grotto. The challenge is that pink tails can only be obtained as a very rare drop from Flan Princesses. To find this particular enemy, you need to venture to a specific room deep within the lunar subterrain, and even if you're in the right location, you only have a 1.56% chance of it appearing. If you're fortunate though, and manage to encounter some Flam Princesses, then the odds are still against you. Final Fantasy IV has a blanket 5% chance of a drop happening after a fight, and because it's a rare drop, the Pink Tail then only has a 1.56% chance of being that drop. The good thing is that you will encounter 5 Flam Princesses at one time, and in the Game Boy Advance and PSP versions, this can be increased to 8. 
But even still, the odds are pretty short, and it can take hours upon hours of grinding, which can equate to hundreds upon hundreds of fights that need to be won, and thousands upon thousands of flam princesses that need to be slain before a single pink tail can be acquired. Not fun, but the reward is at least worth it. We'd also like to give a shout out here to Rydia's hidden summons. They aren't quite as mean to acquire as farming the pink tail due to multiple enemies housing the required drops and them appearing with much higher frequency, but the drop rates for the goblin, bomb, mind flayer and cockatrice summons are still ridiculously low, and unless you're a completionist, probably not worth the effort based on what they actually offer you in combat. But yeah, with that, I think we're done. They were seven of the hardest items to obtain across a broad spectrum of Final Fantasy games. Let us know in the comments below which you found to be the most frustrating to acquire. And of course, if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Raining Ekam, Logan Nijay and Benjamin Snow, who are super special Onion Arms supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.